Who are the Nephilim and why does it contribute to the background and the context of the gospel? Welcome to the program today. My name is Mondo Gonzalez, and I am here in studio with L.A. Marzulli. Appreciate you being Great here. Great to be here, Mondo. Thank you. And we really want to answer this question because we get a lot of questions as it relates to why we spend time on Genesis 6 and other things. But there is a tremendous background to why uh, really Genesis 6, and we see the, the really, L.A., the, the long war against God by uh, the supernatural element. I mean, we understand that, yes, you, you can understand the gospel uh, without any understanding of Genesis 6, but it does provide some background context. And, and for those of you that are new to L.A.'s material, he's been on a seven-film series on the Trail of the Nephilim as well. You've written many books about it, mm -hmm. but kind of give us, if you can, just a couple minutes uh, for those that might not know, what has been the series, this seven-film series about? Well, the, our, our mission statement is to expose the deception of the prince of the power of the air and to herald the return of the King Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so what we do in the series, all, all seven of them, we're showing that there's, there's a hidden history which has been deliberately obfuscated from mm -hmm. the peoples of the world. I mean, it's deliberate. It's right there. It's all over the Americas, all over. It's everywhere. It's global in scope, global in scope. Mm -hmm. And so when we go to these sites and we travel all over the world, of filming, and you've been on some of those adventures mm -hmm. with us. And then we reveal this to the people. It's like, wait a minute, folks, there's another story here. There is something that's been hidden, that's been kind of tucked away. Oh, don't look over here. So we know that there's a war between the fallen angels of, of a third of the host of heaven. We have no idea what that number is. Mm -hmm. Is it 500? I think it's a lot more. Yeah, innumerable Maybe angels we in, know in scripture. Millions and millions mm -hmm. yep. and millions, who knows? And, and the, good, the good guys, the good angels. Mm -hmm. And the protocols of this war, as Gary Stearman would say, we're not privy to. We get glimpses of it, mm -hmm. like in the book of Daniel, yep. when the, the angel shows up with Daniel, hey, I was dispatched the moment you pray, but it took 21 days to get here. Wait a minute, you know, time out. And we, we glance over that, and it's like, well, don't glance. Do a deep dive there. Because we get one of the few glimpses in all of Scripture where we see this supernatural tug of war mm -hmm. and the protocols of which we're not privy to. So, you know, something is going on here. It all hails back really to Genesis 3.15 in the garden where Jesus is there, the dragon's over here, uh, and Adam and Eve, and it says, your seed, and when we got this from Gary Stearman mm -hmm. at the First Mounds Conference. Gary did a, a presentation, it's all about the seed, and we all just sat there with our jaws on the ground. And that... That springboard is when Jesus tells the dragon, it's the first prophecy of the Bible, your seed will be at war, at enmity, your offspring. Your seed, your offspring, will be at enmity, at war. With the offspring, the seed of the woman, he, the coming Messiah, will crush your head. Whoa, wait a minute. That's it. That sets up the rest of the biblical narrative, in my opinion. And this whole tug of war that we see all through Scripture is to somehow stop the seed of the woman from manifesting. What we're talking about here is this history of this supernatural war against God, against the Messiah, against the church, all throughout. And one of the things that you're doing here, which is one of the reasons I was excited to come along, is, is it so far-fetched to look for evidence of what the Bible says? And so really what you're doing is looking for evidence of the Nephilim and uh, in a variety of ways. We, we, we talk about the mounds, we'll talk about a little bit of that at the end, but um, but let's spend some time because I was involved here in, the, in your episode six, where we looked at these. Heavily involved. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. I mean, the, very from, much so. Yeah, from a scientific perspective, we looked at these elongated skulls, and we're not saying that they're Nephilim offspring, uh, but we're looking into it and we're saying, it, could this be evidence uh, scientifically? What do we know? And uh, kind of give a little bit of background from your perspective, and I can certainly tell you from my perspective. Well, when we, uh, this is the work of Brian Forrester. He had a YouTube video. Someone sent it to me. And there's Brian Forrester in what was uh, Senior Juan's Paracas History Museum, the old one, before Senior Juan passed away. Mm -hmm. and, and he's taking these skulls out of a, um, a display case, and they're all elongated. And he's pointing out some of the um, differences between those skulls and a human skull. Mm -hmm. This immediately piqued my interest. And so we mounted the first expedition. This is all in the DNA film, by the way. And we, we do it very quickly. 
showing that you know we went down there. This is what happened. Our first archaeologist, um, Judd Burton, was with us, and Joe Taylor made made one to one mounds. The following mm -hmm. year, we came back and we unwrapped a 2,000 year old mummy skull. Mm -hmm. Who gets to do that? Private museum. We took samples, the, the red hair, and this was the first. We sent the hair off to several DNA. Uh, labs for testing, and what we discovered was a haplogroup showed a Middle Eastern connection, European connection, U2E1, which shows a Eastern European connection. Well, immediately the skeptics go, well, it's contaminated, it's contaminated. Mm -hmm. So enter Mondo Gonzalez. I put an ad in on my blog, you responded to the ad, and it took, what, two to three years yeah. to actually get the permission to come down from the Minister of Culture and take samples, and we got the permission of course, they only gave us one month to mount the expedition. Yeah. And I had a war chest. We had anonymous donors who gave us a, a war chest of money, which enabled this whole process to begin. But we learned so much from 2013 to the present day, so much. And now, of course, in this film, we've got medical doctors, surgeons. We've got yourself, archaeologists, anthropologists, Rick Woodward, mm -hmm. um, a whole plethora of people, different different dynamics, Jeff Dunn, our optometrist, uh, comes on the record. And what we've discovered, and, and I realize this is a bold statement, we are looking, this is not the result of cranial deformation, cradle headboarding, where you take and wrap the skull of an infant. We're not dismissing that, that does happen. Mm -hmm. What we are looking at is something genetic. It's genetic. And so you say, well, LA, who cares? Oh my gosh, because we're not saying, like you said earlier, we can't, we don't know what the nuclear DNA, the father's side, we never were able to get that. So we don't know what it is. But our hypothesis was that if they are Nephilim, then we should see certain characteristics, and my gosh, we do, that are not human. So much so that when the experts in the film look at it, they just look at it and go, whatever this is, this is something that's genetic. It's, it's not a human being. It's not a homo sapiens sapien. It's something else. Now, we're not saying it's Nephilim, but if it's not a homo sapien, then it certainly could be Nephilim. You can't rule that out. And that's why we're on the trail. You know, let me comment on that because <clears throat> if we summarize, well, why does this matter? I think that's a good question. You know, personal friends have asked me, you know, what are you doing and part of it. But it matters because we are looking for evidence of the supernatural, the, the, the and we'll talk about that as well as in, in the next film. But really what we came, what the evidence showed from all the, the morphologies of the skull, from the DNA, um, we recognized that this clearly looks like some level of at least unknown tampering yeah, of, of the genetics of humanity, if we want to call it that. And so when we look at scripture, what we're recognizing in Genesis 6 and, and after, Moses said that in Genesis 6, 4, they were there before the flood and afterwards, that there was a supernatural tampering of the human genome to produce, to produce these Nephilim offspring or some other tribes. And we know, as you mentioned, there's a lot of different tribes that come. And so what LA has been doing, and it's been great to join you, is we're looking for that evidence. Why? Not that we need it. We understand the gospel without it. But it's, it's exciting, honestly. It's really fun to look and, and to go and, and really approach it from a scientific perspective. And some of the things, if, you, if this is new to you, you know, uh, especially the idea of Genesis 6, you know, you've written about it, I've written about it, and this is an opportunity to tell you about our magazine because I wrote two really technical articles that were found in here, um, and as well as in your book. And so we, we like to provide these materials in order for people to uh, really look into the evidence. And so we got a lot to, to, to cover here, but we're going to take a little moment for you uh, to see how you can really get the magazine and continue your own research and understanding. I'd love to tell you how you can subscribe to our magazine, The Prophecy Watcher, and how you can get eight powerful DVDs as a gift from our ministry when you subscribe today. Every day, the prophecies of the Bible get more exciting as we watch world events come into perfect alignment with the words of the ancient prophets. Examine the pre-trib rapture taught by the Apostle Paul. Come to a deeper understanding of the giants of Genesis 6 and the real reason for the flood of Noah. Read about mind-blowing advances in transhumanism and artificial intelligence. Learn about those fascinating subjects you'll probably never hear about in church. UFOs, the Nephilim, the miracles of the Bible, and so much more. It literally is a one-of-a-kind publication. Did I mention the eight bonus DVDs? Enjoy Gary's insights on The Last Trump, a study on the rapture trumpet. 
He examines the controversial giants of the Bible on two DVDs. It's all about the seed and footprints of the Nephilim. Gary shares his own personal encounter with a UFO in the skies over Texas some 50 years ago, a four-hour adventure he must hear to believe in Rescued by an Angel. And he's joined by prophecy expert Thomas Ice in defending the rapture. Lastly, he asks the $64 million question, are we the last generation? 12 issues of the magazine plus eight bonus DVDs represents a $200 value, but it's available today for your gift of $50 or more to support the work of Prophecy Watchers. This offer is available anywhere in the USA. We'll ship both the magazine and the DVDs to you absolutely free. Don't wait or hesitate. Call the toll-free number on your screen or visit our online bookstore at pwdaystar.com. Partner with us today and help us take the message of the soon return of Jesus to the whole world. So I hope you look into that because we have uh, scholars from every really discipline and branch and, and pr providing articles for what we're doing here and it's really top-notch stuff. And, but let's move on here because we talked about the DNA and, and you're in this search and one of the other things that, that you're looking for and that we par I participated in is we would expect, uh, according to what Scripture would say, um, and let me give you a little example, is we, we know of the Nephilim, uh, we're, we're giants. The scripture says that. It talks about their height you know, all over the place, Joshua, you know, Joshua and Deuteronomy and Numbers. But we would expect then for them to have a civilization. Uh, the civilization that would be relatively, when you would look at it, or even their technology, would be more than just normal humanity. So that, that gets into episode seven of what you did, looking at lost civilizations. So let's talk about that. It's, it's lost civilizations is, is really mind blowing, and, and we've always scratched the surface. Um, <laughs> you and I sat in the in the cairn of Gilgal Raphaim, yeah. the the actual tomb of the giant, Gilgal Raphaim. What is it? Forty two thousand tons of basalt rock, heaped up in concentric rings on the plains below Mount Hermon, Nephilim Central. And we sat there and filmed, it's in, it's in episode seven, Lost Civilizations. Mm -hmm. You and I are in the film and, and we're, we're in this enclosure, you know, in, in, that, in that tomb of the giants. And uh, we're, we're talking about that this isn't the burial, it's, it's deep, below, it's it, deep yeah. below. And then you talk about Sardinia. There's this, there's this east to west movement. And so we cut the film right there, and all of a sudden, I am at the tomb of the giants in on the island of Sardinia. Mm -hmm. And then we're pointing out similarities between that tomb and what we find at America Stonehenge. Modern-day archaeologists look, oh, it's just a coincidence. Oh, it's just a coincidence. Everything's just a coincidence. Oh, it's ceremonial. Not so fast, not so fast. There seems to be the megalithic era, um, let's say 3,000 years ago, 3,500 years ago, all these sites, huge stones, I mean, absolutely, you know, some of these things weigh in excess of 20, 40, 80 tons. It's unbelievable. Across the world. Across the world. And it's there for a period of time, and then it all just disappears. It all just goes away. And then we see the builders that come in are building, like normal human beings would, with head signs stones until the advent of the modernity and the Industrial Revolution with cranes and stuff. Something is going on here. And when we were, we were in Israel on our tour, we stop at Dolmens and we film there, mm -hmm. which is also in the film. And you see these uprights with the lentil going across the top. How is this done? How is this done? And whoever is doing it can do it, and they do it very easily, because we believe that there are giants, 8, 9, 10, 12. I mean, Goliath. Yep. Was Goliath really 6 foot, or was he more like 9 to 12 feet? Yeah. I propose the latter. You know, uh, on that, I mean, I wrote an article just this, this last month in the magazine because... Uh, for the archaeology update. This is something that's exciting to me because being in Gath, which is where I did, uh, helped out the excavation there, and just recently, in, beginning in 2015, but as they're continuing to excavate in area, yeah. area D there, uh, over the summer, here we have in, jo in Joshua 11, you know, verses 22 and 23, you can look this up, where the writer is saying, hey, we, we exterminated all the Anakim, but they fled away from us to all the cities, what we'd call the Philistine cities, uh, Ashdod, and Gath is mentioned. That's the first place Gath is mentioned. Well, then later, uh, the archaeology is showing this, this summer, uh, 
the archaeologist there, the director, is talking about this new city that has been discovered on the lower, which is the older city, right. going preceding going to really the 12th, 11th centuries. His words, gigantic, megalithic, enormous stones, large structures, large fortifications, and they haven't even got to it yet. But this, again, goes in line with looking for the evidence. And I hope you find this exciting because it really is, when you look, they didn't have an answer, and it's not excavated fully yet, but they, the, the preliminary stuff is done. And they're going, hmm, this is a distinct city, just happens to co coincide with the time of Goliath, the giants being there, going, is this city go back to the time of Joshua? Because it says many of them fled there. So one of the things that in, in, the, in the video that, that we talked about was how these civilizations came and then... They just vanished. They just vanished. They just, when, when you and I were at Corral, this was in Peru, it's the oldest city in the Americas. It predates everything. And, and this is what people don't get. Well, you know, it's just a bunch of adobe bricks. All right. Wait a minute, not so fast, citizen. What we are looking at is technology, trigonometry, knowledge of the solstices, the equinoxes, advanced building techniques, engineering. It's all there. And guess what? There's no pre-existing culture. It just rises up and, and the plaza is leveled and there's, and there's stele there. It's just like it's mind-boggling. And, and you're sitting here looking at this thing one of the largest pyramids going like, you know, and it all just disappears. Yeah, what we found there, which I think was really exciting, was there was no evidence of any destruction, of any war. No. They, they were living there uh, with complete confidence and security. Um, one of the things that's no interesting, walls no around. walls. No they walls. lacked fortifications, yeah. but they had megalithic things there, but they lacked. It was almost like they were standing there in pride going, bring it on. And no one would even dare uh, to come against us. Um, which to me is, it speaks a lot of, of really the, the nature of, of these giants and these people that dwelled in confidence knowing that no one would, could, could overcome them. What's interesting is, you know, we talk about this Western expansion. So when they flee the promised land, and you were the one that told me about this, there's a stele on the north coast of Africa. We are they who fled from Joshua the robber, the son of Nun. I mean, it's there. You can go and see that. I would like to go there. Well, it's it actually, I'll, I'll make a clarification okay. because... Uh, Procopius is a Greek writer, right. and he writes it in the Middle Ages about him. He makes reference to this monument, which is no longer there. Okay. But it's written, it's written, it's documented that he makes reference to it, and he quotes it as saying, We are the, those, the Phoenicians, that fled from Joshua, the son of Nun. The robber. The robber, <laughs> which is consistent with Joshua 11, them fleeing westward. And, and you mentioned Sardinia, which is in the middle of the Mediterranean. This, this particular uh, monument, which was referenced in the writings, was on the west coast of Africa. And of course, the, the, the hypothesis, which is not wrong to hypothesize, sure. is that they fled across not only to Peru, but also to America, which we'll talk about in a minute. But this, you have this westward expansion. Speak a little bit more about some of the other Mediterranean areas that you saw. Oh my gosh, when you go to the island of Sicily, uh, when you go to Majorca, when you uh, gozo, uh, all these places, I mean, it's just mind-boggling. And, and, and then you, you go and you look at the signage and they try to tell us that these huge megalithic stones, some of them like you know 20 feet tall and, and weighing tons and tons and tons, were rolled across this uneven terrain on these roller stones. Well, has anyone ever tried to do that? Well, no. We actually did, and the stones crumbled. And I remember talking to the docent who, you know, looked around to make sure I wasn't filming her, but she kind of, yeah, yeah, it didn't work, but we still have a sign there anyway. So they're promulgating something which they know is a lie, essentially, that they didn't move the stones that way. We went to a place in Portugal called Zambujero, and this was a mound. And the archaeologist looked at this thing and he went, this looks doesn't look right. It's not blending in with the surrounding terrain. So he began to excavate. And on top he finds this huge megalithic slab of stone. He breaks that open with dynamite. He finds, and they do this whole dig and they deconstruct the mound. There are stones there that are like, we have pictures of it, 25 feet tall. And they're, they're raised up like this, creating this enclosure. Did they go down deep enough? I don't know. Some of these guys go down two or three feet and they think that's it. The, if there's a giant, it's way down below. And we filmed there at Zambujaro and we discovered something about that site and two other sites, which I, which I can't say, speak about right now because this will be in a future film. It blew our minds and we did it on camera accidentally. But it goes into Spain, Menga, Spain, the largest dolmen 
in, in all of Europe, into Portugal, dolmens everywhere, tombs that look exactly like what we have over here. And then you get into the UK, well, France, you know, 80,000 stones at one time for Karnak. We flew the drone there, we spent like almost a week there filming. And then you get to Stonehenge, England, and you sit up there and you look at the mound, Salisbury, and, and, I, and I looked right at the camera. It's gigantic. And I, yeah, and I go, are we in Ohio or somewhere else? Because it looks exactly like an Adena mound. They came over here, they plied their trade, they did not build in stone so much, it was mostly earth, although America Stonehenge is in stone, which is an unbelievable place to go to, and all the connectivity to all the other sites. So they came over here, um, it's global in scope, and what, what, what's really amazes me is the way they've kept it under the radar until really just, just a few years ago where we started to go in and look at this through a biblical lens and going, wait a minute, this is the work of the fallen cherub. This is the work of the Nephilim. You know, if this interests you, we're going to take a little break. You can see all of LA's uh, series, and we, you certainly are still on the trail, and we have some other things that we're working on that we want to talk about after the break. It's always exciting when L.A. Marzulli joins us. His worldwide travels in search of the biblical Nephilim is a fascinating journey into the ancient past. L.A. believes the Nephilim fled the Promised Land, heading west to remote islands and other places like Peru and the U.S. They left behind physical proof all over the world, gigantic megalithic architecture with no human explanation, elongated skulls, enormous six-fingered skeletons. Even our greatest engineers can't explain how these massive monuments and abandoned cities were constructed. You're going to enjoy the journey with L.A. as he takes you on a tour of these ancient monuments. I guarantee you that you have never seen anything quite like this. Today, we're offering you the first six DVDs in the series as part of the Lost Civilizations package with the brand new Lost Civilizations DVD included as a free bonus. You'll receive all seven DVDs for your gift of $125 or more. And as always, free shipping is included anywhere in the USA. We'll also include a free mystery DVD as our way of saying thank you for supporting the important work of Prophecy Watchers. Just call the toll-free number on the screen 24-7 and we'll get all seven volumes in this biblical adventure series on their way to you. Or visit us online at prophecywatchers.tv. Thanks for watching today. Be sure to join us next week for another exciting program. Until then, we'll see you here, there, or in the air. So one of the things, L.A., that you, you mentioned before the break was um, really the mounds that, that you've seen uh, really in all the different parts of really Europe down Everywhere. there. Everywhere. It, it's global. And then we come across to America, and, and it's interesting there, you know, in my own research, um, there, there's this really this label that's thrown out, conspiracy, conspiracy. There's books that are written by people, which is, is surprising. You know, anybody has the opportunity to go and to, and to get, um, really what I mean is the Smithsonian cover-up, is, is it a myth? And there's books that are written that it is a myth by, you know, atheists and others. But I'll tell you, do your own research. I mean, I'm in the process of on a project that we're working on that has just gone on to all of the reports of the Smithsonian. Can't get into it here, we don't have enough time. But all you do is download the reports, you can go, they're all free, um, put in some search terms, which I did, seven footer, eight footer, you know, large, gigantic, giants, and you will be shocked at what you discover. And, and it's interesting that you see they began a systematic uh, exploration of the mounds mm -hmm. uh, really back in the 1850s and 60s, which are all documented in, in these reports of the Smithsonian as well as the Bureau, Bureau of Ethnology. But you see this consistency of the mounds there and the mounds here. You see Abraham Lincoln's quote yes, exactly. talking about this ancient right. race. And the theory today is, well, <laughs> these were all built by the Native Americans. We got a couple minutes here. Share a little bit about why that is just kind of a joke. Well, I mean, there's, there's advanced mathematics in the mounds. For instance, the octagon mound. It's built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. I've talked about this mm -hmm. before. But it, it would be like 
if you and I just fell to Earth and we looked up at the moon and we went, wow, you know, the moon seems to be coming up in a different place and setting in a different place every night. Let's go figure out if there's a cycle here. So you and I go out. We have no computers, nothing to write with. This is 4,000 years ago in America, let's say. So you put a couple of stakes into the ground, make a couple of notches, and we're doing pretty good. We're watching this thing for 20 or 30 days. All of a sudden, a five-day rainstorm comes in, washes everything out. We can't see the moon. We've got to start all over again. The Octagon Mound is, first of all, it encompasses 50 acres. I've been there numerous times. 50 acres. And you have no idea when you're standing in the middle of it what you're looking at. It's built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. Why is that important? Because Native Americans, with all due respect, didn't know, heck, 4,000 years ago, Europeans, for the most part, didn't know it either. 18 and a half year lunar cycle. The Book of Enoch, not part of our canon, I get that, but it is quoted in the Book of Jude and we can appreciate its historicity. The bottom line is this, that in the book of Enoch, there's a fallen angel by the name of Sariel who comes down and hands this knowledge over to mankind. Advanced knowledge. Advanced of knowledge. Astronomy Mathematics and, and the 18 and a half year metonic cycle, lunar cycle. I mean, that's important. Mind-boggling. It's, Mind it's, it's important to understand that, again, there is no disrespect to Native Americans. They're happy to no. say our history doesn't show this uh, this history of writing and, and advanced mathematics and, and trigonometry, some of the other things you, you covered in some of the previous films. But one of the things that we've been working on is um, we've been working on, we've actually excavated a mound and we've done it uh, scientifically and, and, and really done it with, with respect. And if you're out there, uh, we are looking, uh, f again, to continue the pathway of science and to continue to go on, we, they excavated so many thousands and thousands of mounds by the Smithsonian in the late 1800s. And they desecrated them. Yeah, and they desecrated them. And, and what they found was uh, that some of these mounds, especially on the top, were reused, repurposed of some of the more modern right. Native Americans. But when they found below, they found evidence of, a, of an ancient group. And so we're continuing this discovery. And so if, if you... If you happen to know or to have friends or private property that have mounds, again, it's not illegal to do it, and we're doing it with respect for its, with scientific purposes. But and we have archaeologists, anthropologists. We have yep. a whole team of people in a war chest. Yep, and so e email LA on it. So, you know, as we, as we think about really the... L let's wrap it up in a conclusion of why, why does this matter for the average Christian? Because it points to a supernatural worldview. It shows this struggle. It shows that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. It makes the Bible come alive. It gives you the answers. It gives a Christian the, this is the deep end of the pool. It's the deep end of the pool. It's not salvation. That's the shallow end. It's important, but it's the shallow end. We don't have to need to talk about salvation anymore for those of us who are born again and spirit-filled because now we're in the deep end. We're watching the cosmic war unfold between the dragon and his angels and the most high God and his angels. Yeah, if we summarize here, you know, what I think what LA means in the shallow end is that this is the, the basic, the gospel is the basic um, surface understanding of scripture, but there's this whole long war against God yeah. that's, that's deep behind the scenes. It's the context, it's the background. So we hope that uh, we answered the question about why the Nephilim and the supernatural is important. And if you're interested in this, you certainly, we encourage you to not only get our magazine where we discuss these issues, but as well, we, our goal is to educate. And you can see LA's stuff. And we're, we're still on the trail. There's a lot That's of things. That's why we're on the trail. Yeah, there's a lot of things going on. So LA, thank you for being thank here with you, us Mom. today. And Always a pleasure. We appreciate you watching. As always, prophecies um, being unfolded as we watch. The supernatural elements are being shown to be true. And Jesus is returning. So thank you for watching. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter.